Good evening all. Uh, I'm so glad you can all make it this, this evening. Uh, my name's Ryan McCarthy. I'm the Senior Manager of our, our Philanthropy Program at CIRA, and I'm delighted to be here today for our Hope in Sight Community Forum. Before we begin, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional lands of all Victorian clans, their cultural practices and knowledge systems. Uh, I pay my respect to elders past and present who have handed down these systems of practice uh, to each new generation for millennia. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to, to, to all of you, our valued supporters. Because of you, new treatments and therapies being discovered at CIRA put hope in sight for the vision impaired. Just a few items of housekeeping before we begin. The toilets are located through the double doors across, uh, straight across the foyer outside and are fitted for wheelchair users. In the unlikely event of an emergency, we ask that you follow directions from fire wardens and calmly exit the building. Well, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our first Twilight Community Forum held in this beautiful historic building. It's entirely appropriate that we're here this evening when the State Library was established in 1853, the trustees envisioned it as a great emporium of learning. And today is a very special day. This evening's community forum falls on World Sight Day, which focuses on the importance of eye care and eye health initiatives that benefit the well-being, safety and productivity of all people. So in keeping with that theme, tonight you'll hear from three exceptional researchers from the Centre for Eye Research Australia. The subject of our forum this evening is inherited retinal diseases. These are a broad group of genetic eye conditions that cause vision loss and sometimes legal blindness. They can occur from birth through to late adulthood and in fact they are the leading cause of blindness in working age adults. An inherited retinal disease means that retinal cells don't work the way, in the way that they're supposed to. Over time this may result in the loss of vision. In most people, IRDs only affect the eyes. However, some types of IRDs are linked with other health issues such as hearing impairment. Tonight, our expert speakers will explain how their research is changing our knowledge about inherited retinal disease and other eye diseases and what the future holds for eye research and for CIRA. It's something that we're, we're very passionate about uh, at CIRA. Sight is a precious sense, and through our research, we're committed to developing new treatments which improve the lives of people with eye disease and help to save and to restore sight. In a moment, I'll introduce tonight's panellists, but before I do, I'd like to share with you this video which explains a little more about Sarah's work and research. Well, we work in a fantastic field and, and we're at a really exciting time in eye research because building on some of the knowledge that we've gained about how the eye works over the years, we're now starting to turn that into treatments for conditions that were never previously treatable. Technology is transforming eye research. We're seeing advances in imaging technologies which mean that we can see aspects of the eye that we've never been able to see before. My research involves using artificial intelligence to early detect the signs of a condition known as keratoconus. I hope that my research would be able to improve the quality of life of these patients. The research that I do is based around trying to predict who's at highest risk of progressing from the early stages of macular degeneration to the later stages which can have a real serious effect on someone's vision and ability to see. For dry macular degeneration, where cells are dying, we currently have no treatment. And what we've been particularly interested in is trying to slow the progression from the earlier stages to late vision-threatening disease. And at the moment, we have no treatment. But I think we're on the cusp very much of having treatment. Finding new treatments is what we are here to do. And there have been real advances in developing new treatments for vision loss and blindness, but there are still patients that we can't treat. And that's the focus of our work. We want to slow down vision loss in those patients and we want to restore the vision that they've lost to improve the quality of life. My research is in glaucoma and recently we've been investigating vitamin B3 to look at whether you can protect nerve cells and prevent their damage to prevent vision loss in glaucoma. 
current treatments for glaucoma are all targeted at lowering eye pressure. However, we know that some people can still progress and lose vision despite treatment. So new therapies to help these people are always important. Clinical trials are important because they are the most scientific way of making sure that a treatment actually works and is safe. Well, gene therapy can be used in a whole variety of different ways in the eye. And in my work, developing new treatments for glaucoma, we use gene therapy to make the optic nerve more resistant to injury. And ideally that will preserve vision of patients and hopefully also restore vision when patients have lost it. My research is trying to produce a tissue engineered cornea. We're going to use stem cells, which are created from either skin or blood cells, and use those to build corneal transplants in the laboratory. About 12 million people worldwide are waiting on a donor cornea and can't get one. My hope for the research is that we can provide corneal donation tissue, tissue engineered cornea to everyone in the world who needs it. We have kept our, our research going, our clinical research, our lab-based research, the whole way through the pandemic and now that we're coming out the other side of that, we're starting to expand and to grow. So we've got some pretty exciting opportunities to build on the success we have as the largest clinical trial centre for vision and eye research in Australia and, and make ourselves even more capable into the future so that we can help bring new therapies to, to patients. When you do research, you not only help every single person that you see in the room, you actually have the potential of improving the life or the vision of people around the world. That possibility of, of really making a difference to so many people is what I think drives most of us here at Zero. So as we've outlined in that video, we're committed to helping people through our research. Part of our commitment to patients and, and the broader community involves sharing our knowledge at events uh, like this evening's community forum. So tonight we'll be hearing from three researchers who will each be speaking for approximately 15 minutes. We'll have plenty of time uh, afterward uh, and roving microphones um, so that we can uh, answer your questions. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Lauren Ayton. Associate Professor Lauren Ayton is a Principal Research Fellow at CIRA with research interests in inherited retinal disease and gene therapy. Lauren co-leads the Retinal Gene Therapy Unit with Dr Tom Edwards and is also the head of the Vision Optimisation Unit at the University of Melbourne. Her research interests are inherited retinal disease, low vision and interventions to assist people with IRD, including gene therapy. Lauren and Tom's team are working to provide people with IRDs opportunities to be involved in research at all stages, from, nat uh, from natural history studies, online surveys and questionnaires, or clinical treatment trials. Please welcome Associate Professor Lauren Ayton. Great, thank you so much, Ryan. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you tonight to share a little bit about the work that we've been doing into research into inherited retinal diseases. Uh, firstly, it's wonderful to see some familiar faces in the audience. So thank you to all of you who have braved the horrible Melbourne weather to come out tonight. Uh, a little bit of orientation for those of you who can't see me. We're in a room facing a stage that I'm standing on, which is a wooden stage. And I'm wearing a blue and white stripy dress and a black blazer. And I have short brown hair, which is quickly going grey. <laughs> So I wanted to share a bit of the work that we've been doing in our unit. And as Ryan mentioned, this is a unit that is co-led by myself and Tom Edwards. And Tom is a vitreoretinal surgeon, and that means that he is the person that does the operations to deliver a lot of the treatments that I'll talk about today. So many of you in the room will be aware that inherited retinal diseases overall are the most common cause of blindness in people of working age in Australia, but there is a wide diversity in the type of gene that can cause these conditions. We think that around about one in 3,000 people have an inherited retinal disease, but unfortunately we don't have really good data in Australia on that yet, and that's something that our team is working towards. 
Out of these conditions, there are many which will only affect the eye, but as Ryan mentioned, sometimes they will affect other parts of the body as well. And Usher syndrome is the most common of these that affects different parts of the body too. And that can affect people's hearing and sometimes also their um, vestibular system. So their sense of balance can also be affected as well. So for those of you who can uh, see my slides, what I've got is an image of what the retina looks like when somebody has an inherited retinal disease. And the term retinitis pigmentosa is referring to the fact that we see these pigment clumps. So we see patches of black on the retina at the back of the eye in many of these types of IRDs. And that's a way that we can, can diagnose what's happening. But it's only a very small part of the picture. So unfortunately, these are quite a challenging group of conditions to diagnose because there's lots of different factors that come into play. So inherited retinal diseases uh, can uh, onset at different ages. So sometimes people are born with vision loss all the way through to people that may not present with visual symptoms until they're in their 60s or even 70s. And so that's a really big group of people of different ages that have this, you know, early um, experiences of vision loss. I mentioned briefly before that there's lots of different genes that are known to cause these conditions. And at the moment, we know of over 320 different genes. And to give you an idea of how quickly this is changing, in the 1980s, we knew of five genes. So it's a really rapidly changing space. And that means that if you have a genetic test today, you may still very well need to have another genetic test done in five or 10 years, because we're learning more and more about these conditions. The vision loss can alter as well. So some people lose their peripheral vision first, some people lose their central vision first. And of course, this also affects what people's experiences are. So if you lose your peripheral vision, it's harder to walk around and avoid obstacles. People have trouble uh, finding the food on their plate, for example, whereas central vision is very much tied with things like reading and face recognition. So again, some different challenges to consider. Now, an important thing to know is that some of these inherited retinal diseases are stationary. So sometimes people have a certain level of vision and that's what it will stay at. But unfortunately, in a lot of cases, it is progressive. And so the vision loss will change over time. And a big part of what we're trying to do at CIRA is working out which of the genes are at highest risk. So if we can work out what your risk of progression is, we can help counsel people about what they might need to expect in the coming years. Now, this is getting quite scientific now, but it's just interesting to know that these genes can be inherited from your parents in many different ways. So sometimes it is that you have a strong family history of an inherited retinal disease, and sometimes it's like it comes out of the blue. The other thing that we'll often see is that there's families where one arm of the family, it seems like lots of people are affected and the other arm of the family, it's not so. So it is quite complex in terms of the modes of inheritance and also other factors that can influence that. And as I mentioned before, some of these inherited retinal diseases do have other systemic side effects as well. And there's um, a few that are of particular interest to us. We, we do a lot of work in Usher syndrome, there's a condition called refsum, which is actually one where your diet can be altered to sort of help um, moderate your disease, and um, a whole range of different weird and wonderful names, which really just talk about the different aspects of the body that are affected by that gene. Now, in Australia, it's a very interesting question as to what we have in, in our population. So we tend to use data from the US and the UK when we're looking at prevalence numbers. But thankfully, we do have some good registries that are building up. And there was one in Perth uh, called the Australian Inherited Retinal Disease Biobank. And they've published some data looking at what genes have been detected in the Australian population so far. And the take home message here is that most people that have an IRD have a type called retinitis pigmentosa. And this is a condition that affects your peripheral vision first, and then the visual loss tends to sort of move in over time as well. 
Uh, other common conditions in Australia are Stargardt disease, which affects your central vision first, uh, and also Usher syndrome that I mentioned before. Now, as, as um, was mentioned previously by Ryan, what we're really here about at CIRA is working towards new treatments. And it's really exciting for me to compare what the current state is to what it was 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, this slide would have been empty when I'm talking about what the emerging treatments are for IRDs. And now we have a lot more coming up in the pipeline. So for those of you who can see this slide, I, I have a schematic which shows the progression of inherited retinal diseases from when you're first diagnosed all the way through to when your vision is completely lost. And the really good news is that research groups both at CIRA and also around the world are targeting treatments for these different stages of disease. And so this includes things like gene therapy, uh, stem cells, and also medical devices like the bionic eye that many of you will have heard of. And these different treatments are really targeting people at different stages of vision loss. So definitely offering a lot of hope. Now, in terms of gene therapy, it's one of those terms which very much sounds like science fiction. And then when you start to learn more about it, you realise it really is science fiction. So the general idea with, with gene therapy is that there's a gene that's not working properly in the cells in your retina. And so what we can do is put a correct version of that gene into a virus and then inject the virus into the eye. And the virus basically infects the cells in the retina to give them the correct version of the gene. So that means the cell can then work properly again and can you know, really uh, help to preserve the vision of that person. That's sort of the very simplistic way that we do gene therapy. Sometimes it's not that easy. So sometimes the gene that's faulty actually is overactive and so we need to quieten that gene down. And sometimes there's lots of genes involved and so we have to actually be a bit more clever about how we try and protect that retina. But the good news is that, again, we have incredibly brilliant scientists working on ways to optimise how we get this genetic material into the eye. So what sort of vectors do we use to carry the information in and also optimising the actual genes that we put into the retina as well. Now, many of you in the room may have heard of, of a treatment called Luxsterna. So Luxsterna is the first ever direct-to-patient gene therapy. So this is for any disease, not just for the eyes. So it's a really game-changing thing in terms of personalised medicine. The trick with Luxsterna is it's a corrective gene therapy. So this is one of the ones where we're going to put a copy of the correct gene into the retina to restore function of the retina. But it's only suitable for people with a very specific gene mutation. And we think it's around about 2% of people that have retinitis pigmentosa are, will be eligible for this treatment. The exciting thing, though, is Luxsterna should be a once-off treatment. So the cells in our retina don't uh, replicate after we're born. And so if you treat them once, the idea is that that treatment effect should stay for life. And so we are treating children uh, in Melbourne, you know, as young as four years of age. And the really exciting hope for us is that maybe we're actually going to stop the disease in its tracks and, and won't need to, um, you know, worry about them losing vision later on. So there's two treatment sites for Luxterna in Australia. So ourselves in, in Melbourne uh, through the Vic Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital and CIRA and also in Sydney. But I guess the really exciting thing for, for those people that don't have that specific gene is that the success of Luxterna has opened the floodgates. So it's shown drug companies that this can work and it can be a commercial success. And so there's a whole range of gene therapy trials coming down the pipeline. So on my slide, I have a bar graph which is showing which genes are being researched most around the world. And we kind of end up with a top five. So there's conditions like labour congenital amaurosis, and this is the, um, the type of retinitis pigmentosa that Lux Turner treats. You can see how much we love our big words in ophthalmology. 
There's also other types of IRDs, uh, and the names themselves are not really too important. Just to know that there is a lot of research programs going into the most common inherited retinal diseases, as well as the rarer ones. So one of the challenges now is that people that have had inherited retinal diseases have historically not been given much hope from their doctors. And that, you know, is because in the past we didn't really have many options. But now there are these treatments coming down the pipeline, so we really want to start to identify people that might be suitable down the track. And at this point, I'll just pause and say, even though this is very exciting, as we're all aware, drug development does take a long time, so these are not going to be immediate options, but there will be some things coming down the pipeline that we want to know which people could be eligible for it. And so what we need to do is start testing people's genes, start learning more about the people that have these conditions, and really getting ready for, for these new treatments that might come up. And so um, on my slide, I have a world map, and the world map is coloured depending on how many scientific publications have come from a certain part of the world reporting what genes have caused an inherited retinal disease. And unfortunately, we haven't had many of these publications in Australia. And so this is what we're now working towards. We're working with other sites around the country to start to collect this information. It's not as easy as just doing a simple blood test and getting the answer though. So unfortunately, genetic testing quite often doesn't give us an answer. And in about four out of 10 people, we won't be able to solve the genetic mutation at the point in time that we're at now. Even when we do have a suspicion about what the gene is, sometimes we have to test other family members or do additional testing to really solve that puzzle. So it's not as simple as, you know, you go into your pharmacy, do a blood test and the answer is there, but it's getting better over time. So that what we call the diagnostic yield or how successful our genetic testing is, is getting better year by year and will continue to do so. Another really important part of, of us assessing these inherited retinal diseases is obviously looking at the retina. This is the part that is affected most in these conditions. So the retina is like the film in the camera. So it's a very thin piece of tissue at the back of your eye. And to give you an idea, it's about the thickness and the fragility of a wet piece of tissue. So when you think about the surgeons that are doing operations on this retina, it gives you a lot of respect. It's a very fragile thing. But the beautiful thing with the retina is that we can take photos of it after we put drops in your eyes to dilate the pupil and get really lovely images of the back of the eye. And we can use different wavelengths of light to test different parts of the retina and also do tests like a visual field for example, which many of you may have done before, which allow us to look at what the retina looks like and compare it to what the retina is working like. And we call that phenotype, genotype correlations. So a really interesting question for us has been, what do people think about these treatments? So obviously people are starting to hear about these things through the media and um, the media love a catchphrase about the bionic eye or gene therapy, but it's really important to us to know what people with inherited retinal diseases think. And so we did a survey last year of almost 700 people with inherited retinal diseases, and many of you may be in the audience, and if you participated, a huge thank you. We were completely blown away. To give you an idea, these surveys normally get about 50 people responding, so 700 was amazing. And what it meant is that we can make some really good judgments on how people are feeling about these treatments. And one of the things that we were most interested in is how much do people want gene therapy? And we found that overall, people were very excited about this idea. So 92% of people said that they would have gene therapy for their eye condition if it was available for them. But one of the tricks is then about 28% of these people said that they actually felt like they knew what gene therapy was. 
And so obviously this is a bit of a gap. And so a big part of what we're trying to do now is educate people. So you being here tonight is, is fantastic for us because we want to make sure that people are aware of, of what the treatments are and what the possibilities are in the future. So a big part of our program, and a lot of my team from Venture are here tonight with us, um, is building up a registry of people that have inherited retinal diseases. So Tom and I are very privileged to lead this group. And what we do is invite people that have inherited retinal diseases to register with us. Now, their involvement can vary. So some people say, I'd just like to go on the list. That's all I really have time for at the moment. Whereas other people are happy to come in and see us so that we can take images of the eyes and test the vision. That then allows us to collect information about the different inherited retinal diseases. So we know what types of genes we see in Australia. We know the correlation between a particular gene and somebody's level of vision. And it also allows us to identify people that might be suitable for some of the clinical trials that are coming up as well. So that's a really important reason for our registry. The other thing that we do sometimes is we ask people that are in our study if they'd be willing to give us a sample, maybe of their blood or maybe of their skin, and we can then use that back in our laboratories to actually develop new treatments and work out how their disease is developing as well. So it's a very circular kind of program um, and we're very, very proud of what it's become. So as I mentioned, if anyone here is, is interested in venture, your level of involvement very much varies on where you are in your particular life at the moment. So if you don't have enough time to come in and see us, we still would love to hear from you. But obviously for us, the richest data is from people that can come in and we learn all about their eyes and their quality of life and everything we can. So the third part of that venture that program that I just talked about was the clinical trials. And so we're incredibly privileged at CIRA to have a really wonderful clinical trials group. And we are basically offering people access to some early treatments through our clinical trials. And Baj from my team is gonna talk a little bit later about what it means to be involved in a clinical trial. But to give you an idea of some of the things we're doing, we have um, gene therapy trials in place for both macular degeneration and some other conditions. We have some pharmaceutical trials for things like Usher disease um, and Stuttgart disease. And also we're running some natural history studies. So looking at how people's eyes change over time when they don't take any drugs or have any surgeries. And that's also linked in with some of our industry partners. Another thing that we're very proud of is we've recently become a site for a group called the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And this is the largest consortium of people working in inherited retinal diseases in the world. And we're their first Australian site, so they're very proud of us. Um, and what this means is that we're able, with people's consent, to share de-identified data about these inherited conditions with a group around the world. So sometimes the gene that someone has, there might only be three or four people in Australia that have that gene, but there'll be more people in the US and the UK and Europe. And so we can share our knowledge about these conditions to, to get better outcomes as well. Another aspect of our work is really trying to improve the care for people that have these conditions. So for those of you in the audience that have an eye condition, you might be aware that every time you go to see somebody, you're repeating the story again, especially if you have something like a syndrome where you've got to see different types of, of doctors. And so we've been working at identifying what the gaps are in knowledge and trying to break down those silos so that eye people only know about eye things and ear people only know about ear things. So we've done a number of studies looking at what the gaps in knowledge are and why these barriers and these silos are forming. And we're actually taking it right back to university level. So we're trying to change the way that clinicians are trained at the university so that they get exposure to thinking about people as people rather than just as a pair of eyes. 
I just wanted to finish up just quickly by a big shout out to our, I think, most important partners. And that's obviously the people that work with us that have these inherited retinal diseases and also the support groups. So places like Retina Australia, Usher Kids, Vision Australia are all really important partners for our research. They allow us to communicate our research out to people that have these conditions and also allow you know, pathways in to us so that people can contact us if they have particular questions. So thank you so much for listening um, a bit about what our research is. Hopefully I can answer some questions at the end of the session and I'll pass back over to Ryan now to introduce the next speaker. Thank you all. Thank you, Lauren. I think Lauren's really highlighted um, how important uh, community is to us at CIRA. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Professor Keith Martin. B Professor Keith Martin is CIRA's Managing Director. His research focuses on glaucoma, particularly investigating new strategies uh, to protect and regenerate the optic nerve. Professor Martin is also a clinician, scientist, ophthalmologist and professor and head of ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne. His research is focused on developing new strategies to protect and regenerate the optic nerve in glaucoma, the leading cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. He was the first in the world to demonstrate that gene therapy and stem cell therapy could reduce retinal ganglion cell death in an experimental model of glaucoma. Professor Martin is also the current president of the Australia and New Zealand Glaucoma Society and the past president of the UK and Ireland Glaucoma Society and the World Glaucoma Association. So now I'll hand you over to Professor Keith Martin. Thank you. Well, thanks, Ryan, and, and I'd like to uh, start by thanking you for coming out on a filthy Melbourne evening. I'm from Ireland originally. I thought I knew rain until I moved here. Um, so hats off to Melbourne for really turning it on this evening, turning on the, that, uh, that rather wet charm. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the other things that we can do with gene therapy, but one of the things about uh, t teaching is we're told to tell you what we're going to tell you, and then tell you it, and then tell you it again. So I'm going to emphasize again some of the concepts that Lauren spoke to us about, just to really get them into your head so that you understand what we're talking about. And so, so Lauren introduced you to gene therapy. I'm going to show you just a little animation um, that puts that into motion, if you like, uh, what, what we were talking about. Gene therapy is a technique we can use to treat blindness or vision loss caused by defective or missing genes. Our genes make us who we are and influence how different parts of our body work, including our eyes. With gene therapy, we first identify a defective gene causing blindness or vision loss, then we create a correct, functioning copy in the lab. This correct copy is then merged with a modified, safe virus known as a viral vector. This virus can't cause infection, but is very effective at getting genes into cells. Finally, we inject the virus directly into the eye, and the correct gene is delivered to the target cells. Gene therapy can be used to treat a wide range of diseases by delivering genes that help make cells in the eye more resistant to injury. It can also be used to directly edit genes, where we can replace a faulty section of DNA. And so that gives you, again, uh, an idea of how we're doing this. And, and everyone in this room has experienced gene therapy, believe it or not, because the viruses that we use are actually modified viruses. They're very similar to the viruses that give us a cold or, or give us a sore throat. Um, and what we do is we actually swap out the bad genes and replace them with something that does something useful. But we use all the same machinery. So, so you can think of it like an addressed envelope, but rather than having a nasty message within it that's going through the letterbox, it's got something helpful um, in there that can actually improve things rather than make things uh, worse. And there are a number of different strategies that we can use. And again, Lauren introduced some of those today. We can, if a gene is missing, and that's what happens in many of the inherited retinal diseases, we can replace it. We can toughen up cells that are under stress, and, and that's what we do in other conditions like glaucoma that I work on, or macular degeneration. We can try to make cells in the eye more resistant to injury. 
we're starting to be able to use these techniques to edit genes, and I think that's a really exciting uh, new development that we have as well. So when there are little mistakes uh, within genes, rather than replace the whole gene, we now have tools that we can go in, molecular scissors, if you like, that we can go in and actually remove just the tiny little segment that's wrong and, and correct it, correct that spelling mistake in the instructions that are being given to the cell. And if you correct the, the spelling mistake, it then makes sense and the cell can read that message and do what it should do again. We can use gene therapy also to reprogram cells from one type to another. And this is, may sound like science fiction, but we can actually use this technology to turn non-light sensitive cells within the eye into cells that are sensitive to light. So we can take cells that have no responsiveness to light, we can change the genes they express, and we can make them behave like photoreceptors. And again, this is a really exciting development for diseases that involve loss of photoreceptors, because as Lauren told you, there are currently 300 different genes, um, that, that or more than 300 genes, that cause these inherited diseases. It's going to take a really long time to get 300 different separate gene therapies but what if we could have one therapy when the photoreceptors have lost that creates new photoreceptors irrespective of which particular gene problem you have? And I think that's a really exciting new approach that, that again, we're working on uh, at CIRA. So this is a mature technology now. So I used to talk about this 20 years ago and it was sort of science fiction and people said, this is never gonna, never gonna happen. And of course, it's happening now. And uh, vision and eye research is at the very forefront of this technology. We're further ahead with gene therapy in the eye than any other part of the body. Uh, so that's a really uh, exciting thing to hang on to. And that's partly because the eye is such a good target. It's small uh, relative to other organs. You can imagine how much bigger the liver, for example, is, or the heart, if you're targeting these with um, gene therapy. We can hit pretty much all the cells of interest within the eye with a single tiny injection into the eye, which is a real uh, luxury that we have working on the eye. And we've got these fantastic modified viruses that we're using, and you'll hear about some of the other things that are coming along, te other technologies that can add to those viral techniques, new ways to deliver genes to cells, and Sandy, who will speak next, will tell you about some of those. And um, again, we've got this to the clinic and the safety record has been very good. Again, that's reassuring because as we build up experience with these new therapies, um, we are increasingly confident that the tools that we're using are not causing big problems within the eye. Now, we still have to test to see whether they improve things, but what we're seeing so far with the treatments that have come to clinic, and quite a few have come to clinical trials now, is that they're not um, doing harm which is a really important uh, part of this as well. And we can use the tools that we have to target different types of cell within the eye. So we can address these viruses to different cell types. We can change the envelope, if you like, um, so that it gets addressed to a certain member of the family uh, rather than uh, everybody in the family. Um, and again, this is some work that we did uh, recently showing how we can do this within the eye to cells that connect the eye to the brain. So these green streaks that you see here in this X shape are the connections between retinal ganglion cells in the retina on their way back and crossing over as they go back to the brain. And they're green because we've used gene therapy to express a green protein, just as proof of concept that we can uh, turn these cells uh, change the gene expression the whole way back from the eye to the brain, again, just with a single injection in the eye. So it's a really powerful uh, technology that we have. And we need these treatments. And again, Lauren, Lauren introduced how we can use these treatments for inherited retinal disease, and she showed us how much of a problem uh, that is and how common relatively these diseases are as the, as the commonest cause of visual loss in the working age population in Australia. Think about that. That's the, the, these grouped together are the leading cause of why people who are working age uh, can't, can't see. Um, neck and neck in some countries with diabetic retinopathy, but treatments for diabetic retinopathy have moved forward um, um, quite quickly over the last few years. And so, and so these inherited diseases in many developed countries are, 
are more uh, a cause of vision loss in the working age population. So we've made real progress and uh, you heard about the conditions already, uh, inherited conditions where we're making good progress. Uh, but we're also starting to use these technologies for other common diseases of aging. And I know we're talking mainly about inherited diseases um, today, but in the elderly population, it's glaucoma, it's macular degeneration, it's also diabetic retinopathy that are the big causes of blindness. And all of these now have emerging gene therapy treatments um, that are coming to the clinic. So they're lagging a little bit behind um, some of the uh, inherited retinal diseases, but we are already doing um, studies um, for, for example, types of macular degeneration at the Centre for Eye Research. And so we want those treatments to be the next Luxterna. Luxterna, as Lauren said, was the trailblazer, the first treatment to come through. It won't be the last. And uh, just to give you a flavour of what we're doing at CIRA, we've uh, treated numerous patients now with gene therapies, both in clinical trials and with Luxterna. And there are exciting new things coming through with uh, treatments for glaucoma, uh, and for other inherited retinal diseases and uh, new therapies with the reprogramming strategies, which I think are, are, are really exciting as an alternative to uh, trying to develop separate treatments for all of the different single gene diseases. Um, this is a, a video made by uh, Tom Edwards, who works uh, with Lauren and myself. And this is the actual process of delivering the gene therapy to the eye. So what you're seeing here is a tiny little cannula going underneath the retina of the eye. And I'll show you that again, uh, just so you can see it again. And on the right is a scan simultaneously. And what you'll see is a bulge appear uh, on the right um, as the injection goes through. And that bulge is the actual gene therapy going into the eye underneath the retina um, through a cannula which is thinner than a human hair. Um, so it's uh, a very delicate uh, procedure. So just as a, a taster of the other things that we're doing, um, a lot of my work over the last 20 years has been developing a gene therapy for uh, glaucoma. Um, and that involves a whole bunch of different work to try and work out which types of gene we can express in cells that make up the optic nerve to make them more resistant to injury uh, and ideally improve their, their level of function. And, uh, and that's really around what we do when lowering the pressure in the eye, which is the only treatment we have for glaucoma currently, and we can lower the pressure by eye drops or by laser treatment or by surgery, um, but all of the treatments we have for glaucoma work by lowering pressure in the eye. And so my work is around what happens in the 15% of cases where that's not enough to prevent someone losing the vision in their eye uh, over, over time. Uh, and again, I won't bore you with too many um, graphs and uh, pictures today. This is really just to show you that we can not only test these different strategies in, uh, in models of glaucoma, we can quantify their effectiveness. And so, and so all these little red blobs are actually labeled cells within the retina. Uh, and what we can do is we can count those little red blobs to demonstrate how effectively our treatments can reduce the loss of cells in the retina in, in uh, models of glaucoma. Um, so we have really good quantitative techniques that help us to work out which of these treatments are the most effective. And, and the one that's most effective is the one that we're bringing through uh, and it's approaching clinical trials in humans, which we hope will be the first gene therapy uh, clinical trial in the world for uh, uh, glaucoma. And then I'll leave you with a, another um, technology which is more of a, a moonshot, if you like, at the moment. So, so what I've been telling you about so far is treatments that can protect the optic nerve against damage. Now, the problem at the moment is that if we lose cells in the optic nerve and we lose those connections to the brain, they don't regrow. So we don't have any way to make them regrow again. And that's a problem in the optic nerve. It's a problem in the spinal cord. It's why when you have an accident uh, or you have an injury or, or, uh, and you damage your spinal cord, that's usually it in, and, in, and the function that you've lost does not normally tend to recover. Same when you damage the optic nerve, it doesn't tend to get better. 
And yet when we injure our skin or, or, um, and, and we, we have a, a cut, for example, where we have a patch of numbness, that recovers because peripheral nerves know how to regrow. Central nerves have forgotten some point during our, our, our development. And so, and so a lot of the focus of my research over the years has been what, what parts of this have they forgotten and can we remind them how to regenerate again by changing, you know, perhaps they've forgotten to express one particular gene enough. Can we, just by changing that one gene, can we remind them how to, to regenerate? Um, and, and again, I'll just show you one little experiment that we did during this. And we always do these sort of things in the dish uh, first, so we can culture nerve cells in the dish. And this is a culturing retinal ganglion cells, which are cells within the retina. And normally, when you isolate these cells from adults, they, they can't regenerate. And so if you cut them, that's it. They, they don't regenerate. And so what we did is we took these cells and we cultured them in the dish. Um, and then we used a laser under a microscope to cut those individual very, very, very fine uh, little nerve fibers. And, and they don't normally regenerate. And you can see here, uh, we've reminded them how to regenerate just by expressing one additional protein uh, within these cells called protrudin. And uh, again, the clue is in the name. Protrudin is a gene that helps things protrude, be that a cell that's trying to move around the body or uh, a, a new nerve cell that's trying to develop or a new nerve or a nerve that's trying to regenerate. And so, and so by overexpressing this protrudin, we can drive long range regeneration. So that's a long way from restoring function in people with glaucoma but it's one of the first demonstrations that we can actually do this and, and, and change these cells in a way that makes them better regenerators. Um, so just to summarize, I think we've made really good progress for uh, a few of the inherited retinal diseases that we heard about this evening already. Um, and gene editing technologies are really coming along and I think are in another exciting uh, way that we'll be able to potentially repair some of these defects uh, in the future. Uh, where we can't repair the defects or where the cells have died. You can't repair a defect in a cell that's gone. We're working out how to replace those lost cells as well by using reprogramming from other cell types within the retina. And then we're using these technologies in, in common eye diseases uh, as well, such as glaucoma and macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. So it's a really exciting uh, time to be in this field. Uh, and we're on the cusp of a whole host of new treatments across the whole spectrum of eye disease using these technologies, which I think is really exciting. So I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll hand back to, to Ryan to uh, introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Keith. I'm sure uh, you'll all agree it's absolutely extraordinary work and we're very lucky to have um, researchers who can translate it for us so effectively. Our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sandy Hung. Sandy's a research fellow in the Clinical Genetics Unit, headed by uh, Professor Alex Hewitt at CIRA. Sandy's a basic research scientist with a specialisation in molecular biology. Her current research interest is in, in developing improved gene delivery methods with the aim of providing better treatments for inherited, inherited retinal diseases. Sandy completed her PhD at the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute and went on to do postdoctoral research in the USA at the University of California and the National Institute for Aging. Upon returning to Australia, she joined CIRA and tackled projects developing gene editing and now gene delivery tools to correct various inherited retinal diseases. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandy Hong. Thank you, Ryan, for the introductions. Um, and welcome, everyone, and thank you for taking your time and for taking an interest in the work that we do at Sierra. So I'll be representing the basic researchers um, in the wet lab laboratories um, and sharing with you, I'd like to present some of the projects that we are currently working on in the lab, um, where we are trying to um, develop new gene delivery systems to pit a target retinal cells. So um, this is Harry. Um, Harry has Usher syndrome. He has a mutation in the protocoherin, protocoherin gene, um, which caused him to lose his hearing from birth and also is starting to lose his vision. 
So for his hearing, he was able to get the cochlear implant to hear, help him hear again. Um, here's a picture of him, um, of Harry, with um, Professor Graham Clark, the inventor of the cochlear implant. However, even with the latest exciting developments in treatment for the eye using gene therapies, unfortunately, in Harry's case, the protocoherent gene, um, if we wanted to replace it with a healthy, um, a good um, gene, it is too big to fit in the currently um, used delivery systems. So, um, in fact, a number of other inherited retina diseases also, also fit under this category. So, I have a graph um, showing genes that are affected in the various um, inherited retina diseases. Um, and as Lauren mentioned, that there are more than 300 um, mutations and known genes. Um, so, the size of the bars here indicate that the size of the, the gene, when the red dotted line um, red dotted line shows the cutoff point in which the currently available delivery system that Keith and, and Lauren mentioned um, using the AAV virus can package. So any gene below this, um, including Luxterna, which is shown in the blue, um, can fit into this AAV. However, there are still a number, a number of genes that cannot be packaged using this um, AAV um, virus. And, oh, and furthermore, with the rapid advancements in gene editing field, we are now able to use various gene editing tools to mediate the correction of single mutations using base editors or sections of genes using prime editors in a precise manner. So therefore, we do have the ability now to correct many of the genes which are mutated in inherited retinal diseases. However, these molecular, molecular tools, like many of the genes that are infected in inherited retinal diseases, are too large to be packaged into this single AV um, delivery tool. So the, the ability to deliver larger genes or gene editing tools into the retina is currently a major bottleneck in the gene therapy field, where on one hand, um, although AAVs can target cells in the retina very well, it is limited by the size of the cargo that it can package. On the other hand, other viral um, delivery systems with larger packaging capacity lack the efficiency and specificity to target the cells in the retina. So you could picture it as the AV being the equivalent of a taxi and the other viruses as a bus, where the taxi can take limited number of passengers directly to its destination. However, the bus, even though it has the capacity to carry more passengers, it usually takes an indirect route and might not be able to take the passengers directly to their destination. So, um, so the current problem is that we cannot efficiently deliver larger genes using the other bigger viral delivery systems to the retinal cells. And the solution would be to actually engineer these larger viral um, delivery systems to make it so that it can target retinal cells better. And so I'll start with um, how and what, what, what are viruses. So a virus are, is actually a particle composed of several components, a cargo um, genetic material, which is enclosed in a viral envelope. And on the viral envelope, there are surface proteins which have a role in affecting the type of cells that they, can, they are able to target. So in order to make a virus to have better targeting efficiencies to the retina, we will be adding molecules to the surface of these viruses to make it target photoreceptor cells better. And to do this, we will be using two directed evolution strategies to generate better photoreceptor targeting molecules. So the first strategy would be to use a library of virus with different surfaces and then apply them to retina model systems such as the um, human donor retinal explant culture or in the mouse retina. And then from those retina cells that are targeted by the virus, we can um, viruses effectively can then be identified and then selected. Um, to, 
which a new evolved library of the virus can then be generated and further enhanced again through this evolution technique. Through several rounds of this selection, we can make better targeting viruses to the retina. A second approach that we, are, um, that we were um, currently trying to uh, um, do in the lab will be to take photoreceptor, these photoreceptor targeting molecules and involve these, evolve these in a separate yeast model system, where after several rounds of selection, the top photoreceptor binding candidates will then be attached to the viruses and tested for its ability to en enhance photoreceptor targeting. And so the advantages of our engineered virus system is that um, we can deliver packaged lar larger genes and that we have enhanced efficiency and specificity to target the photoreceptor cells. And because we are targeting um, photoreceptor cells, um, it, be, uh, it can be of benefit to multiple retina diseases where the photoreceptor cells are affected. So for our current project, we are developing the gene delivery system to target photoreceptors. But in the future, um, we can use the photoreceptor targeting molecules here, developed here to enhance the other delivery systems, such as viral light particles, other virus systems with even larger um, delivery capacity. And this can also be used to enhance the um, current delivery system, AAV. And furthermore, we can use the same evolution strategy that we developed for this project in other retina cell types, such as retina ganglion cells, as well as retina pigmented epithelium. So it just remains to thank um, the team that's involved in this project. So as um, Ryan mentioned, I'm a research fellow in the clinical genetics unit headed by um, Professor Alex Hewitt. Um, we also have our collaborators, Chi Lu and Carla Abbott from um, Professor Robin Geimer and Penny Allen's lab. And also have to thank the um, Lions Eye Bank Donation Service for providing us with some research donor tissue so that we can do some of these preclinical work in the lab before we bring it to the clinic. We um, also have collaborators um, from different parts of Australia. Um, and also need to thank the funding bodies for making our, um, giving us this opportunity to work on these projects. And in particular, um, the projects that I've mentioned in this talk um, were funded um, um, through our institute's own internal funding system. Um, it's called the Innovation Fund. So it helps um, uh, us, uh, helps uh, kickstart um, projects um, which might be out there so that we can continue to try and develop therapies for um, retina diseases in the future. So thank you very much for attention. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. You can see um, how our researchers are tackling um, these uh, eye diseases from so many different perspectives. Um, we have tonight an additional speaker, Baj Gruel. Uh, Baj is an optometrist and clinical trial coordinator with a focus on inherited retinal diseases, particularly retinitis pigmentosa and Stargardt's disease. With a passion for research as well as working with patients, uh, Baj works within the retinal gene therapy unit where she coordinates clinical trials aimed at finding treatment options for people with inherited retinal diseases. In addition to her role as a clinical trial coordinator, Baj has recently embarked on her academic ju uh, journey by pursuing a PhD aligned with her research interests. Thank you, Baj. Thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. So today I'm gonna to be talking about participating in clinical trials. So clinical trials are research interventions um, in which people volunteer to test new treatments or interventions to potentially prevent, detect, treat, or manage various diseases or medical conditions. Clinical trials generate valuable data that contributes to scientific knowledge and ensure that healthcare practices are based on solid scientific evidence, leading to better treatments, improved patient outcomes, and advancements in medical science. 
So there are different phases to clinical trials before a treatment can be approved and available at the pharmacy. Pre-clinical trials are tests and experiments conducted in a lab before they're tested in humans. Phase one is a small group of healthy volunteers are given the treatment to evaluate safety and determine any side effects. Phase two includes administrating the treatment to participants with the specific condition the treatment is hoping to treat. Typical, typically there is certain inclusion and exclusion criteria that the participants need to meet. Phase three is similar to the previous phase and is opened up to more people with the condition and the inclusion and exclusion criteria is usually more relaxed. Once a treatment has gone through phase three, it goes through the food and drug administration approval process before it can be prescribed and placed on pharmacy shelves. There is also another phase not shown here, which is phase four clinical trials, and it's longitudinal studies to monitor the effectiveness of the treatment after it has been approved. So at the Centre for Eye Research Australia, we conduct clinical trials for a variety of eye conditions, included age-related macular degeneration, inherited retinal diseases, glaucoma, diabetic eye disease, and many more. Some clinical trials include gene therapy, oral tablets, retinal laser injections, and natural history studies. So what can you expect if you volunteer to participate in a clinical trial at CIRA? Before the clinical trial can start, you meet with the study team to make sure that the trial is suitable for you. At this screening visit, the study doctor and study coordinator explain the trial, answer your questions and give you written information inclu including a consent form. Some questions you might have include how long the trial will take, any risks and benefits associated and what happens if you want to stop. You then undergo a series of tests and assessments to confirm whether you are eligible for the study. The study doctor examines your eyes with a microscope that gives you a magnified view of the front and back of the eye and will also perform a range of general health testing to confirm eligibility. Because clinical trials aim to find out if new treatments work, they need to recruit participants with specific health profiles. This means that not all patients are suitable for a particular trial. If this is the case, the doctor will discuss this with you. If you are eligible for a particular study, you are then booked in for your first treatment if applicable. At the next appointment, you're assigned to a particular treatment group and begin treatment. Typically in clinical trials, we usually compare two or more treatment options, which may include a group which is no treatment or placebo, and this is unbeknownst to the participant, the study coordinators, and the doctors to reduce any bias. For the duration of the clinical trial, there is periodic appointments where the study coordinator and study doctor perform a series of tests to ensure safety of the participant and to measure the outcome of the treatment. These appointments are also an opportunity for our participants to discuss any concerns they may have about the trial or their eye condition. And sometimes this can turn into a bit of a life debrief because we really get to know our participants. All of this work, however, cannot be done without our amazing volunteers and participants. At CIRA, we aim to make the clinical trial process as comfortable and enjoyable as possible. Thanks to our participants' generous and invaluable contribution to science, we are able to make strides towards the medical advancements and fight against incurable diseases. Participating in clinical trials is not just a gift to science, but also a beacon of hope for patients and their families. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you so much, Baj. I'm now going to ask Callum and Matt, who both have microphones, um, so you can ask any of today's speakers a question. Please forgive this pictures of me up at the moment for some reason, I'm not sure why. But, um, but I'd like to invite our um, speakers to come and join, join uh, us on the stage um, so they can answer your questions. Thank you. 
So if you'd just like to put your hand up, um, Matt and Callum will, will come to you with the microphone shortly. Hello, um, it's Fleur, you all know me, but I have been asked uh, to ask a question from someone in the audience, so I am their voice. The question is that they have autosomal dominant retinitis pigmentosa and their family and themselves have all done genetic tests but they haven't been able to find a causative gene. They are interested in knowing what gene agnostic therapies, and agnostic for everyone means just non-gene specific therapies, are available that aren't reliant on a causative gene. If you can answer that question, please. Yes, well, thank you for the question. And, and, and that is something, actually, that did come up a little bit when I was talking about the cell reprogramming uh, approaches. And, uh, and, and that's where I see there being a real opportunity to have these treatments that work across multiple different types of uh, disease. So, and it's not, we don't have to do one or the other. And I think, I think some of these, what we call disease agnostic approaches, in other words, where, where the disease itself doesn't matter, you're just dealing with the fact that you've lost photoreceptors. Um, some of these will be uh, buying time, if you like, because if you, if you think about it, when we reprogram the cells of somebody who's got a genetic disease, those reprogrammed cells will still have the mistake. So that's an important point. We haven't fixed the problem. We've bought some time. So we've taken a situation where people perhaps have been losing photoreceptors over years, and we give them a treatment, we reprogram them, but then they will start to lose them again. But we've hopefully bought them some, some years where we can wait for other treatments to come along. So it's not an either or. I think these are complementary uh, approaches, and, uh, and I think we would really like to get to the stage where we can buy time quickly in the next few years so that as the real fixes come along with gene editing or with, um, with other types of technology, uh, those patients are then eligible for, for those treatments as well. And one of the really important things about the work that Sandy uh, is doing, um, targeting other types of um, vector that aren't viruses, uh, that's really important because, because in the future we're probably going to have to treat people several different times with therapies. And the problem we're trying to do that with a virus is our immune systems are smart. And so when they've seen the virus once, they know it's coming and they'll attack it perhaps the next time and then it won't work so well. And that's a good thing if it's a disease. It's a bad thing if it's a therapy. And, and what we're hoping is that some of the new technologies that Sandy and others are developing we will have a better ability because they're not viruses to retreat re people as well um, down the line. So that's a bit of a long-winded answer. Um, but, but I see the, the, the key messages are that there are complementary technologies. Uh, we're not putting all the eggs in just one basket. And, and, and there will be multiple different treatments that will become available. And some people may need more than one. Um, yeah, we have another question from um, one of our uh, Sierra online community, um, and that is conditions such as uh, dry and wet AMD now have treatment options. Um, what is the likelihood of a similar outcome for retinitis pigmentosa within the next five years? Uh, look, it's a great question, and, and it's definitely one that we get a lot. And I think, you know, as we've sort of covered in, in, in the talks, one of the challenges is that, you know, these are very complex conditions. And so it's not as simple as just every inherited retinal disease having the same treatment. So we have Luxterna available now commercially, and so that's a huge thing, and that really has opened the, the door. The other treatments that are coming through, most of them are in that sort of phase one or two, um, clinical trials that Barge was talking about, but we do have a number that are in phase three around the world. So when they get to phase three, we're hopeful that sort of in the next five or so years, we, we might have some more on the market. Um, 
My name is Dino Farinato and I have Rhett Pig. And for the last 30 years or so, I've been told uh, there's nothing at the moment, but within five to ten years, there will be something. And that message has been very constant, which is somewhat disappointing. But I'm delighted to hear the developments that have been talked about today. Um, I'd like to understand how much of this is a, a race against um, other researchers around the world and how much of it is a co collaboration? That's a great question and, and I might just, I'll start by definitely, I completely understand. I think every time you ask a researcher how long it's going to take till a treatment's ready, we say five to ten years. <laughs> so huge apologies for that. I know that we, we do say that. But look, I think the commercial access now to gene therapies, as, as Keith mentioned, it, it's just a game changer. It means that the drug companies are, are, are investing and, and we really are moving forward quite quickly now. Um, to your second point, uh, look, it's definitely, um, you know, um, a collaborative thing is, is uh, really how I would describe it. And I think a large part of that with inherited retinal diseases is because these are rare conditions. So, you know, there's really no point different groups competing against each other because we won't find the answers that we want quick enough. And so the Foundation Fighting Blindness that I mentioned that SEER is a partner of is very much that global push to bring everyone together. But we're doing that on a national scale as well. So the main hubs for inherited retinal disease research in Australia are ourselves, Perth at the Lion's Eye Institute and Sydney uh, at Safe Sight Institute. And so we work very closely with those groups as well. So it's, um, it's a lovely space to be in as a researcher because we're, we're constantly sharing information and helping each other with projects. If I could just add to that, I, I, my view is that good, good science involves a combination of, of competition and, and collaboration. Think of the International Space Station. That's been one of the greatest technological achievements of our, our times and has generated a whole new range of... Uh, knowledge about the, the universe and, and that has brought the Russians and the Americans who f argue and fight and have so many different conflicts together for a common cause and uh, in the research community we're probably not usually that adversarial although there are exceptions to that, that rule um, but, but we compete for, for research funding and I think that's healthy because that enables the best uh, ideas to, to compete for the finite resources that we have. But then we build international collaborations to solve some of these problems. And, uh, and, and many of us here, Lauren and myself, are involved in large international collaborations where we actually meet with uh, researchers from around the world to try and crack some of these problems. And that's the fun part of science in a lot of ways, is that collaborative aspect as well. But there is uh, a combination of that collaboration and competition. Hi, thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, this is a probably fairly simple question for Baj about clinical trials. Um, uh, my name's Carmel McNaughton. I was in a, a clinical trial at CIRA, which was a fabulous experience. Wonderful staff. Um, and, and what I'm uh, con interested in is, do you get dropout rates? Because I do remember a couple of people dropped out of the clinical trial I was in. I can't imagine why, but they did for whatever reason. And it's such an investment. And, and without the data, a complete set of data on each participant, then, you know, it's dodgy. So are there ways, you know, two questions, I guess. What is the uh, dropout rate in the clinical trials at CIRA? And how are you trying to stop people from giving up? Well, firstly, I'm really happy to hear that you had a great experience. I think we all really try hard to, to make our um, participants enjoy their experience in clinical trials. With any clinical trial, there are drop of, dropout rates and there's, of course, different reasons why people drop out. But I think... You know, despite what sort of, you know, whether they're at the very beginning of the trial or they're at the very end stages, the data is still very usable um, and, you know, it's still useful clinical information even if they don't completely follow through. 
So in terms of that, you know, we try to understand why people drop out and what the reasoning is. And when we go forward with other trials, we try to mitigate those reasons. But of course, there are reasons that we can't control. Um, but, you know, it's still very useful information, despite, you know, whether they complete the trial or if they fall short of the, of the end. So. Hello. Um, my family are affected um, with retinal, retinal disease on the RPGR gene. There was a, a slide that you showed when you were showing what fits in that vi you know, the, the, um, the virus, sorry, I'm not very medical at all, but the virus that, that can now be infected. I couldn't see where RPGR was in that. It was a, the t lots of genes along the bottom and it was tiny and I tried really hard to see, but I couldn't see if, if RPGR was on there or if it was too big or did fit in there. Um, so Are you able to tell me or? Um, not right off, I have to search up the gene size, up. but um, yeah, so the AV can only fit like four point something killer bases in, in terms of the size, but happy to search it up for you. <laughs> um, but also it may be on that slide, I just couldn't see it because was it? You're quick. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So there we have the answer. It does fit. <laughs> And the reason that Fleury is so confident as well is because there are clinical trials underway for gene therapy for RPGR using the AAV virus. So we know it, we know it works um, and we're hoping to get some of those trials to Australia when they're ready. Hi, um, Jill has a case of teleform and uh, uh, with that trying to understand, there's no uh, uh, identification of uh, genes associated with that now at this time, but when you were talking about uh, the question of editing and uh, reprogramming, and this, uh, this is more perhaps my understanding, but are you talking about within the retina reprogramming some of those genes to actually perform different functions or you're talking about some other uh, way and how is that then um, done in terms of uh, transporting the information so to speak? Well, I could maybe take that one. So, so the reprogramming also uses the gene therapy um, Technology. So, so we use the same sort of viruses at the moment, um, but we use that to take little messages called transcription factors into the into the cell, and 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 what we do is we change the balance of gene expression within the cell, and um, and some of this technology has come out of uh, an understanding of of how stem cells uh, function because it has been um, discovered, and it was the, 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 the subject of a Nobel Prize, that just four transcription factors, changing those four transcription factors within a cell, can turn uh, a cell like a skin cell back into a stem cell that can then produce any different type of cell within the body. Um, and that was a really important discovery. In other words, that all of our cells contain all of the information to make all of the different tissues within our body. It's a case of which genes are actually switched on in the particular type of cell that determines what they become and whether they become a heart cell or a lung cell or an eye cell. But all of the instructions are there. You've just got to switch on the right things within the cell. It's all sitting there waiting to be activated. And so the clever part of reprogramming is that we use this gene therapy vector to flick a few switches within the cell to turn a few key genes on that then change one type of cell into another. And think of it a bit like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It looks impossible if you came from a different, you know, planet and you, and you, and you watch this happen, you're thinking, this, this just doesn't seem possible. You have something that's completely different becoming something else. 
what we're doing with reprogramming is something similar, but at a single cell level. So rather than happening at the, the level of the whole animal, it's happening at a single cell level. So we're turning that, that caterpillar, non-light sensitive cell into a, a light sensitive butterfly, if you like, by, by flicking some of these genes on. So it sounds like it's, in, you know, it sounds impossible, but, but it only works because every cell in our body has all of the genetic code. There's all of the instructions in there somewhere. Uh, you just got to turn the right things on. Um, I just wanted to ask, you talked a bit about uh, viral vectors and using those to get gene therapies into the retina. Obviously, over the last, I think, probably you know, three years, there's been a significant focus on mRNA uh, vaccines and mRNA technology being able to you know, uh, repro or reprogram your immune system to recognise certain proteins, and so then you can develop a response. I guess I'm just curious as to whether the... Uh, that sort of technology, that mRNA technology, is applicable in this space in terms of developing gene therapies? That's a, that's a really good question. And this is a technology which is coming on um, very, very quickly. And, and for those of you that, that, that don't know, mRNA, and you may have heard of this in the context, if you remember the, the, the Pfizer vaccine was an mRNA vaccine. So mRNA, um, when we have our genes, that's the instructions. What we want to produce is a protein. Now, what the mRNA is, is an, an, a, a notelet, if you like, for a particular gene. So your genes are all, you know, you've got many, many genes. If you want to make a new protein, the mRNA is a, a sort of, almost like a brass rubbing or an impression of that one gene that gives them the instructions to build the protein, so it's the, it's the actual plan for that specific gene. Now, the issue with that is that that is a very temporary um, construct, so mRNA doesn't hang around very long. So if what you're trying to do is produce a vaccine that, that in, uh, induces an immune response, that's fine, because you don't necessarily want that to, to last very long. As soon as your immune system sees it, your immune system can then go on and, uh, and build up immunity to that. But it doesn't matter that it wasn't there very long. For treating some of these conditions, it, it, it does matter if, because you need the good protein to continue to be made for a long time. And yet, if you're only delivering the post-it note, that's not a, 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 that doesn't enable the, the protein to be made in the long term. It's a short-term Thing. And so that's things. And there are techniques that can be used to stabilize mRNA and make it more resistant to degradation, and those can help um, as well. Um, but it is a, a sort of evolving field to work out how to use that technology for long-term treatment of, of, of chronic diseases. Uh, so we're not quite there yet, but we are exploring it because it's the, the, one of the things, the, 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 the good things, if there is a good thing about the pandemic, is it's really accelerated the, this technology. And Melbourne is at the forefront of that now. So there's been a huge investment by the, the state government here in mRNA technology. And so, you know, I think, I think we're going to see real developments in that field in the coming years as well. So just because we can't do it now, um, um, I think we will be figuring out ways to make use of this technology for the sort of things that we're doing. Um, uh, my question is really about your re relationship with pharmaceutical companies. Um, do you find this restricting or liberating? Again, a, a great question. And, and, and we have a range of different relationships with, with pharmaceutical companies. Um, that, and, and, and sometimes it's um, more transactional. So, so we have the expertise to run the clinical trials and we, we are one of the best centres in the world and that's not me telling you, that's them telling us. Uh, that's why they keep coming um, back to, to, to us for those clinical trials, because we have that, that expertise. But the model that we've created is that we try to now use that resource coming in from those commercial clinical trials to, to bring the next 
a set of new developments from the lab through. And so, so what we've tried to create is this virtuous cycle where we recycle that funding. Because we're a not-for-profit organization, um, when we make some uh, money from the clinical trials that we run commercially, all of that funding then gets recycled back into our pipeline and, and funds uh, discovery work in the lab, the sort of stuff that Sandy is, is doing. So our innovation fund that she mentioned is actually paid for um, through a combination of, of, of funding that comes from um, philanthropic donations, but also we use funding from our clinical trials uh, to support the next generation of things coming through. And the other part of the relationship we have that's less transactional is we actually help the companies design better trials. Um, and, and one of the things that is very common in uh, industry is that industry people are all about the, the treatment and they sort of forget about the endpoints that they're measuring. And this has led to the demise of some very promising treatments because the wrong thing has been measured. You know, and again, we've talked a lot about Luxterna. If we'd used the conventional endpoint or for most vision trials in something like macular degeneration, which is how many letters can you read on an eye chart, Luxterna would never have got through. So Luxterna got through because they realized that it was never going to work on that. So what meaningful endpoint to the patient could we measure? And, and what that turned out to be was navigation in low light. That's a real problem for people with retinitis pigmentosa. So the researchers who developed this treatment, initially with dogs, demonstrated that the dogs who were treated could navigate better in low light through mazes. And now Lauren has a setup where she can do exactly these measurements in our patients as well. And that's not just gaming it to try and find something that is improved. It's actually something which is of real quality of life value to people with inherited retinal disease. You take someone who cannot navigate in low light and you turn them into somebody who can run around the house again. That's what's happening with the, these treatments. And, and one of the young seven-year-olds, I think, that we treated recently, that Tom Edwards treated, that's exactly what happened. So the parents reported within a few weeks of the treatment, they were running around the house again in a way that they hadn't been able to do um, before. So we can help them design better trials. We can use their funding to do new things. Um, and, and, and our view has always been that engaging with the pharmaceutical industry and helping to guide them to do better trials and then helping use their resources to support new work is, is, is much better than disengaging. Um, or not, not, not engaging. So, so again, a long, long answer to the question, but I hope that captures what, what you were wanting to hear. I might just add to that as well. One of the other things that CRA is doing is actually generating our own companies, so our own startups and spin-out companies. And so our relationships with bigger pharma companies are almost in a way a bit of education for our researchers as well. So we can learn from how they've done things um, and learn, you know, how we would want these companies that are being formed from CIRA to, to work? One of the other things we're doing, for example, with Roche, which was one of the very big pharmaceutical companies, is uh, Robin Geimer, who's one of our senior researchers, spent a year on sabbatical there, helping to f drive the direction of their research in macular degeneration. And she has subsequently become the global um, chief investigator for one of their trials, which she has nagged them into doing and prioritizing over the other things that they could be doing. Um, so she went out to, to, to be a, a visiting professor there for a year. Um, and now we have some of the Rush people coming through CIRA. We're educating them on the patient pathways for the management of macular degeneration. And we have some funding from them to, to do what they're calling preceptorships for their staff so that they can learn more about um, you know, the, uh, how patients actually experience some of the diseases and what some of the, the, the problems are that patients have so they can help to solve them. So I think that sort of partnership is, is unusual um, on an on a, on a international basis, but I think, you know, something that we are, are actively developing. Sorry, I think for Lauren, you mentioned um, that there's RPGR trials overseas that might be coming here. Um, can you let me know what stage they're at? Um, so 
at the risk of five to ten years is the answer being. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also, what sort of qualification criteria do you look at? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, so basically, there are obviously a number of trials coming through, and the inclusion criteria for all the trials does vary from, from case to case. So the best way, obviously, is to get in touch with us, and we can do a screening visit, like Baj mentioned, and sort of um, let people know what is coming up in the near future and the not so not so close future. Um, RPGR is an interesting one. So Keith mentioned before that one of the challenges with some of the trials to date has been outcome measures not being appropriate. So some of the RPGR studies have hit that. So they have sort of got up to that phase two and then not gone any further because they didn't hit the targets that they were aiming for. And so a big part of what the international you know, community is now doing in this space is talking with the FDA. So I met with the Food and Drug Administration a few weeks ago with a consortium of researchers, and we're really trying to communicate to them that you know, the trials need to be designed better so that we get them through quicker. And so in term, coming back to your question about RPGR trials, so the one that was the most advanced, unfortunately, has hit a little bit of a wobble, um, but there are more coming up behind that. And to give you an indication of how the pharmaceutical companies feel about that, we've been approached by Janssen, who's the pharmaceutical arm of Johnson & Johnson, to run a natural history study of RPGR because they know that, that you know, it's one of their key targets. So they, they will be trying to, to find people for those, those trials in the near future. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, that's our final question for this evening. And we greatly value uh, the opportunity to, uh, to continue these conversations at our uh, community forum. So thank you so much for your questions. Um, just quickly, well, it, today is, is, a, is a special day uh, for CIRA uh, and, and for this community. It is World Site Day, and that coincides with a very important date in our fundraising calendar. So it would be remiss of me not to mention that today, um, for 24 hours, I think we've, we've got um, a number of hours to go until about midnight tonight, we are running our fourth annual Hope in Sight Giving Day. It's a great way to support uh, the research that you've heard about tonight. So when you took your seat this evening, you would have found a, a flyer, hopefully, looks a little bit like this with a QR code on it, featuring Daniel and his father, Vince, uh, who are the face and the hero of this year's Giving Day and, and the current uh, issue of our visionary magazine. So our goal today was to raise $150,000 for vital funding to find treatment to improve the lives of patients with eye disease. Uh, we had a small number of uh, uh, generous donors also agree to match the first 50,000 uh, uh, raised. And I'm del delighted to announce that we've now uh, reached our target of $150,000. We've, we've exceeded that and uh, we have now um, uh, extended uh, our giving day and we're, we're, we're hoping to reach a target of $175,000. So if you'd like to join our, our generous donors and make a donation to this year's Giving Day, you can do so um, via the QR code on your seat or by visiting our website. Um, and that support is, is vital in helping our scientists and clinicians to continue their, their life-changing research and to help us to plan for long-term inquiries into eye conditions uh, and, uh, and long-term projects. So I do hope that you found tonight's uh, discussion informative and that you've had some new insights into some of the, the research and treatments that are on the horizon. It's a very exciting time for, for CIRA and for our research and we are always delighted to share news of our progress and, and developments with you. Um, I'd like, before we finish, um, if, you, if you'd like to join me once again in offering a round of applause for our presenters. <laughs> Lauren, Keith, Sandy and Baj, thank you so much. And thank you to you all for coming along tonight. It's, been, uh, it's always a pleasure to meet with you. And we look forward to seeing you at the next community event. <laughs>